welcome. I'm Nelifa. This is Dear World Live. How do we uh, construct our economy in a way that is climate friendly? It's two times as difficult for disabled people dealing with COVID than it is for their non-disabled peers. How do we actually ensure women's inclusion? How do we ensure women's safety? Hi and welcome. It's me, Nella Fahidayad. Welcome to a brand new season of Dear World Live brought to you by Doha Debates. This season, we are taking a special look uh, and focus at the idea of bridging divides in this polarized world that we're living in. I'm sure you know exactly what I mean. You can sort of feel it, can't you? Today, we are live from the South by Southwest EDU conference and we'll be talking uh, about teaching and learning in a seemingly ever more polarized world. Now in a moment I'm going to be joined by my wonderful guests. Jayatma Wickramanayaka is the United Nations Youth Envoy and Fatima Akilu is a psychologist and counter extremism expert. But before that I wanted to sort of set the scene uh, and, and the context, really, for what we mean when we start talking about polarization. Uh, of course, there are lots of issues that divide us, but the coronavirus pandemic specifically, it seems to have sort of magnified a lot of those issues. From the gap between rich and poor, the gender divide, to the deepening political differences, a lot of the inequalities within our society have been brought into stark relief by the pandemic. And we've even found a whole host of new issues to be divided about. From the issue of wearing a mask to vaccines and social distancing, the pandemic has shown us how divided we can truly be. But how does all of that relate to education? Well, to get an answer to that, we spoke to someone with an incredibly deep knowledge uh, and experience working within the education system at a global level. Julia Gillard is the former Prime Minister of Australia and the Chair of the Board of the Global Partnership for Education. And her organisation works to reform education systems at an international level. I had a chance to interview her very recently for an upcoming episode of Course Correction, a podcast uh, that I host for the Doha Debates. She told me about her hope for education around the world in this moment of crisis and opportunity. I can see two futures in front of us, and I think this is the moment in which the world is making the decision. We're going to make the decision in the coming months as to whether post-COVID we actually recognise what's truly important. We build back better, to use the terminology, and building back better would mean putting gender equality right at the centre of decision-making and making sure that every child, every girl, every boy right around the planet could get a great quality education. But I can see another future, and it's the one that we need to avoid, where government budgets are really hit by the economic shock of COVID-19, that governments retreat their expenditure on education, that that cements pre-existing inequalities based on poverty and race and gender, and we are in a world where the most marginalised children are, once again, far more likely to miss out than children generally. So that, to me, is the future we definitely have to reject. Clear warning there from Julia Gillard, former Prime Minister of Australia. And if you want to hear more from that amazing interview, there is lots more that she says, actually. Uh, make sure that you check out Course Correction, a podcast that I uh, make for Doha Debates. It's available across all the platforms. Make sure you follow and you subscribe. You can binge on season one right now if you like. Don't forget, this show, Dear World Live, 
is nothing without you. Please get in touch with us. Tell me who you are and where you're watching from. I will be sure to get your comments and your questions into the show as much as I can once we meet our guests. And we're about ready to meet our guests, I think. So let's get on with it. I'm joined by Jayathma Wickramanayaka, the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth and Fatima Akilu, the director of the Neem Foundation and a psychologist in her own right. And as ever, we're joined by a wonderful student and an audience member this week from India. I've got Bhagarshi Prabhartan Dokar. She's the founder of Youth Magazine, an author, a poet, an illustrator, and a public speaker. Oh, that's quite a bit, uh, from India. We will speak to her shortly, but first, if I can go to my two guests, Jayathma first and then Fatima. I want to ask you a very focused question briefly. How do you see the education, the idea of education, the system of education being critical to the fight against polarization? I think, Nelufa, when we talk about polarization, there are numerous ways that polarization occurs in our society, affecting both current and future generations, particularly those who are not even born yet. We are witnessing growing polarization, as you said also in your introduction, within countries, between countries, between political ideologies, between political parties, between the haves and the have-nots, as well as between generations. So education, I would like to argue, plays a hugely important role in leveling the playing field, in equipping people, especially young people, with the skills and knowledge they need to not just survive, but thrive in a world that is becoming increasingly polarized. So my thesis today is affordable, accessible and quality education is one of the most important tools that we have at our disposal in fighting social inequalities, which in turn will help us deal with polarization. Jasma, thank you. Very interesting opening remarks. I will be asking you uh, to get into detail later on, but I'd like to turn to Fatima Akilu at this point. It's easy to kind of talk about education being the cure-all. What about educating in a quite polarized world that we live in today? Well, I think um, as we're seeing, as the world has become smaller, we have become wider apart. And education has played a role both for good and for bad, because in some areas, uh, education has also been an instrument that's been used to polarize, to divide us into groups along ethnic lines, religious lines and politics. So I think we need to claim, reclaim the ground uh, and remember, it wasn't always like this. Uh, education has unpin, underpinned most of our civilizations. And it can, again, uh, as long as we really look at and address the issues of access, funding, uh, more spaces for girls, and uh, more equality within the education system. Thank you so much, Fatima. Jayathma, let me, let me kind of get into your job. I mean, you represent all young people to the United Nations and vice versa. And this cohort of young people under 24 year olds, the largest to have ever existed in humanity, the potential that education has, but also the limitations that a good education brings all in our hands right now. Do you see young people being as divided as other generations seem to be? I think, uh, uh... Nelufa, young people are, even though we tend to think of them as a homogeneous group, young people really are a demographic group, which is actually a microcosm of society. So when you say young people, even though the immediate idea that we get is, you know, a bunch of people with backpacks and mobile phones, like going around in a school or a campus, actually young people are very diverse. It's young women, young girls, refugees, LGBTIQ young people, young people from various political and economic backgrounds. So even if you look at sort of different very polarized groups, it could be extremist groups, it could be political party groups, uh, you see young people within these cohorts as well. So what I'm trying to do through my job and my work is to not to see young people as a binary. So either they are a victim of polarization or extre extremism, or they're the perpetrator of victim victimhood or polarization, but to really see young people as those who can play an active role when it comes to repairing the social fabric and when it comes to driving our societies forward, because that's what majority of young people are. 
I love I love that you you said that because I am I'm guilty of that all the time. I think of young people in my in my old age of 33. I think of young people as the sort of like group of, that that I used to belong to but that means nothing to me now. You know, oh, the, the young people they'll save the climate crisis, they'll save us from this and that and the polarization situation that we have. But young people, especially those under the age of 24, are placed in a really critical time in the history of this planet. But how do we get, how do, how do young people in your experience from what you've seen engage with those that they disagree with? Because I fundamentally think that they do hold the answer to that. I, I agree with you, Nelly Fan. You know, when usually I sometimes get this question, so how, how are young people doing? And what, what are young people doing today? And I say, I usually use a Charles Dickens quote to answer that. I say that it's the best of the times to be a young person, but it's also the worst of the times. You know, it's the best of the times because, you know, you have access to technology, you're connected, you're the most interconnected generation ever. But it's also the worst of the times because you're suffering from so many different ta- challenges, from multi-dimensional challenges challenges like climate change to the COVID-19 pandemic, the economic crisis, extremism, violence, um, to mental health. Young people are struggling with so many issues. But as you rightly said, if you look at issues like climate change, it is young people who are at the forefront of bringing about that change. You look at Myanmar today, it is young people who are on the streets demanding for democracy to take back their country. We've seen this in Thailand, very recently in Nigeria during those SARS protests. And what I really want to highlight today in this conversation is that young people are incredibly resilient. Even though they are one of the most vulnerable groups when it comes to these economic and political and environmental shocks, they also hold those answers. And they have the fantastic ability to divide, reach across the divide and build coalitions in order to drive towards a common goal, which is oftentimes holding the leaders, political leaders of previous generations accountable. I love that. The idea of young people holding those in power accountable. We'll get into that shortly. But for now, I want to thank all our wonderful viewers. Thank you for watching. This is Dear World Live. I'm Nella Fahidayad. And for those of you who are joining us from Texas, British Columbia, Libya, Pakistan, Madagascar, Madagascar, I think that's our first from Madagascar, Qatar. Um, you are so welcome to this episode on education coming to you live from South by Southwest EDU. Remember, get involved. Write me your comments, your questions about education. We've got two very incredibly uh, skilled experts here on the show. Do you buy what they're selling? Do you agree? Is education a panacea that can bridge all divides? Or are there things that we need to have including in this debate. Fatima, I want to come to you directly because your expertise is very much needed. You you work a lot and and try to help victims, um, but also ex-members of the Boko Haram group. And I just want to give a bit of an overview for our wonderful uh, viewers. Boko Haram is a terrorist organization in Nigeria, Chad, Niger, and Northern Cameroon. Over the last 10 years, they have killed thousands of people, displaced millions and abducted thousands of women, girls and children. And in 2014, uh, many people will remember the infamous kidnapping of 276 schoolgirls sparking a global social media campaign, hashtag bring back our girls. Now the words Boko Haram translate to Western education is forbidden. And their ultimate ambition is the establishment of an Islamic state under Islamic law, Fatima. It would be an understatement to say that you are working in a highly polarized world. Let's let's go back to basics because it is very hard to, to for, for young people to, to check out their mental health, check out their lives at home, at the door of the classroom, and then walk in and have a great educational experience. So what do you do to even get them through the door, to even entertain the idea of getting an education? Well, unfortunately, as we've seen uh, across Nigeria, education has now become a weapon of war. Uh, Just in the last month alone, we've seen an incidence of almost three different kidnappings in schools where hundreds of young people have been taken by terrorists. Uh, They use education to manipulate um, uh, young people uh, in particular, uh, uh, really. But if you look at how terrorists use education within their own camps within their own training, education is uh, valued. 
they have doctors, they have people who uh, really have a high knowledge of technology. Uh, so when uh, Boko Haram says that education is uh, haram, it, it really it's a manipulation. Uh, what they're saying is uh, forms of Western education in their interpretation to do with democracy in the ways that society organizes themselves is what they are against, uh, not education per se, why? because they understand why, the why value. Why specifically Western education? What exactly? I've always tried to understand this, and forgive me, it, it's just my inability to understand. How can learning be seen as harmful? What is it about Western education? Because I've had a Western education, and and I don't feel like I'm any worse for it. So how are they using education in like a like a, as you said, like a weapon? I mean, that's that's a strong way to put it. Absolutely. And uh, I think all of us here have had Western educations and have been beneficiaries of uh, Western style education. And I think even in ancient times, uh, Western education has had high value. Uh, in Islamic states, uh, there was quite uh, advances in science, in, in, in poetry, in art, in literature. So it's not a new concept as such, but it's a manipulation of learning. Uh, what they're trying to do is establish an Islamic state. and um, uh, the the style of Western education, I think they feel uh, gives young people too much uh, uh, ability to think for themselves, to question, to challenge, if you like. And uh, uh, because Western education, I think uh, one of the foundations of, of Western education is to teach us how to think critically, how to, uh, how to debate, how to uh, look at opposing views. And if you have people that uh, have that ability, it's going to uh, become very difficult for your project where you want people to think in a very linear kind of fashion so that they believe in your narrative. And I, I think that's what's at the bottom of it. it. It's incredible the work that you do and, and we all know how important it is because education, as you have mentioned, and as Jathma has said, can be a, a way to get escape poverty, escape those sort of um, situations. So, at this point, it's time to bring in our wonderful guest from India. Bhagatshri Prabhartan Dhokar is the founder of Youth Magazine, an author, a poet, an illustrator, a public speaker, and a wonderful person all around from India. Bhagatshri, thank you for joining us. First of all, what do you make of the conversation we're having so far, briefly? Yeah, so firstly, I really like the point that um, Jayatam Man made about Education is also about equipping young people, not just to survive, but also to thrive and adapt to the society. And especially in this polarized world, it is very important to know what is happening in the society right now. Because being a young person myself, especially in this pandemic, I see that there are these two groups of students where some of them who have that intellectual awakening, who are aware of what is happening around in this world and what is their greater responsibility to create an impact in this world? While there's also a group of students who don't have access to resources, who don't have internet access, and they're falling behind in some or the other way. And I see that there's a lack of equal opportunities according to geographical dimensions of their homelands. Because, yes, I see that um, the opportunities provided to students from developed countries is much more than those from underdeveloped countries. Well, I'm glad you thought it useful. It's now time for you to get some answers. Do you have a question for our wonderful guests? Oh, yes. I have a particular question that I would like to ask. How do you think is it important to include topics like mental health, climate change and activism in today's curriculum? Who is that for, uh, Bhagatshri? And then we'll get to the other person. Okay, so I would like Jayatama Ma'am to answer the question because I feel that unless you are educated about these important topics, topics you won't be able to take productive and tangible action on these. Jayatama, you're in the Thank you. Thanks, Vagashri. I think you raise a very important point, you know, like is our education systems today updated enough to actually talk about the issues that are affecting the generation that is going to live with the repercussions of 
the the consequences of the decisions that are being made today for an example um, i remember when i was in high school when we learned about climate change it was about sort of an ice cap and a polar bear um, and we were never sort of made to understand or taught how climate change is affecting us today as we are in sri lanka sort of in my village where where i am living you know so i think uh, from from here until now i don't think much has been done to actually familiarize and contextualize some of these things that are still concepts for many young people even though that is the reality that they are living in so that bridging that concepts into the lived realities is not happening even though intergovernmentally governments have agreed you know the paris agreements 12th 12th article of the paris agreement says that climate education has to be mainstreamed into educational curriculums but except for italy who has made a commitment to make climate education mandatory no other country has even uh, spoken about it so, uh, so i'm think- hearing that there are severe shortfalls when it comes to ratifying implementing these things it, 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 that thing is happening again fatima where we know what is good we know how to implement what is good but we're not doing it especially when it comes to places uh, like Afghanistan where I'm from where education is it's just it's a luxury that so many don't have access to what do you make of Bhagarshi's question that we need to have mental health we need to have uh, social studies cultural studies uh, climate change climate crisis studies put into our education is that doable in places like Nigeria Afghanistan Chad elsewhere uh, thank you for your question, Bagashiri. It's so important and, and you touch my heart too when you talk about mental health, of course. Um, education, as the oldest person on this panel, <laughs> I must say that you're right. Education has to always adapt. Uh, when I was in school, um, the things that were pertinent to our time has completely changed. We weren't thinking about mental health. We had very little understanding of mental health. We, climate change was not the issue it is today. So we must adapt, we must change, curriculums must continually evolve. I think uh, you're right, uh, Jayatina, when you say that at the governmental level, very often uh, these uh, changes are taken into consideration, uh, but it takes a long time for it to uh, tr- uh, really to translate down into the curriculum. Uh, for example, now we see that uh, mental health has really become the issue of our time, um, mostly affecting young people. And there are no strategies uh, within the educational system to deal with mental health, or very little. And when they are strategies, it's mostly in the Western world. In countries like mine, uh, mental health is still given a very, very low priority. We have been terrible victims, so we don't even have to look so far out of climate change. We've seen this education. Yes. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you there. I, I, I wanted to get Bhagashree's impression on what you said, because both of you made a really, really important point. Um, Bhagashree, for your generation, mental health uh, has a different meaning to even when I was in school, Jayatma or Fatima. Do you think it's more important to learn about you know, mental health than it is math and writing and uh, 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 reading? You know, it, it doesn't seem to be like a, an important skill, does it? Do you, do you value it that much? I would like to answer this question by stating an analogy. Um, I was just talking about this previously to a student. So a student's life is like running a mental marathon. But then when you're suffering from anxiety or depression or any other form of eating disorder or mental health issues, and you don't get the access to the resources, which is actually happening right now, it is like running a marathon with a 10 kg baggage on your back. And that is what is happening currently, because being a student I have known that there has been no proper education, no resources for mental health issues. And especially our generation or these young people are trying to adapt and trying to thrive in this world about where to get resources Uh, and for these resources on their own. So, th- I mean, my goodness, you should do this show. Um, I, absolutely wonderful point made. Um, I would like to put uh, Jatma and Fatima and everyone into the conversation at the same time. So feel free to get involved. You've got this 10 kg back on your back, Bugger Street. You're trying to run the mental marathon of getting education. And then COVID-19 happens. My goodness, it couldn't be a harder time. Couldn't we use this moment of crisis, my wonderful guests, as a, as a moment of opportunity? And if so, how, Jatma? 
I think particularly also looking at mental health, I saw a research very recently in the UK, for an example, 82% of young people have said that their mental health hadn't gotten worse during the pandemic. 82% mm. of young people. This is not, uh, you know, this is not uh, some random statistic. This is young people t- talking to policymakers about the issues that they're facing. And the, the thing I wanted to mention was, as Bhagatri very correctly said, even though we don't have a formal way of learning about mental health issues or accessing those resources, young people still find ways to be resilient and to adapt because some of them were saying not going to school affects their mental health because by going to school, they get to interact with their peers. They get to join their scouting groups, their student groups. They get to talk to some of their favorite teachers. And by that, they can sometimes deal with, tackle with the mental health issues informally, even though may not be formally through these adaptation mechanisms. Raise your hands if school was more uh, about making friends, learning about soci- soci- socializing. Raise your hands if school was as important for making friends and socializing as it was for edu- Two ha- I've got more hands than people here. Clearly, school, education, isn't just about books. My wonderful audience, um, those of you watching Dear World Live, you all know this. So send in your comments. What does education mean to you? You've got a couple of more minutes before I get to that. But before I do so, I want to go to Fatima very, very quickly. You work in an area where the mere idea of an education can get you killed. How are you dealing with the with the COVID-19 crisis on top of all of this? How, has it set you back? And be realistic here. I think this has been a real tragedy, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, because a lot of people don't know that what's happened in a lot of countries, including mine, is that uh, there's been a big push towards girls' education and getting girls in school. And we have been making uh, really good tracks. And then the COVID-19 pandemic happened. And you see a lot of families now marrying off these underage girls because they can't cope with it. Their their situation has changed. Uh, They've got increased poverty. And that's another hungry mouth um, Uh, in the home and that's truncated those young girls ambitions so it's been very very tragic and I think going back to the issue of uh, mental health um, and education what does education mean really education is much more than just learning Uh, you said is it about Mm -hmm. learning arithmetic and reading and writing of course not education is what teaches us how to be in the world it gives us the platform to reach our self-aspirational goals and if that is truncated uh, you have a lot of people that are floundering and that also contributes and affects their mental health which we're seeing in a lot of places where schools have now been closed both due to uh, COVID-19 pandemic but also due to increased insecurity in across um, many many parts of the world Okay, thank you very much. Now, stay right there because we're coming back to our guests uh, for for hopefully what can be seen as, well, on our way to finding a solution to these very, very big problems. But before we get there, I want to thank all of my viewers, all of those uh, of you tuning in on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever you're watching, you're very welcome. This is Dear World Live coming to you from the South by Southwest. West EDU uh, event, coming to you live, in fact. It's good to have you. Thank you for being here. Um, and you have been sending in your comments uh, and questions. We've got someone with the handle Shergillo uh, who got in touch via Twitter and says, no better way to bridge divides in today's world with children than in camps where they see no color, no diversity. I know I had thousands and thousands of children through residential camps. They can play, they can uh, have sunlight, fun water be kids what a great loss to lose camp Uh, i imagine these are camps uh, where you can go for weeks and and learn uh, in ways that aren't necessarily in a school setting i've never been to camp did you enjoy camp let me know on youtube we have hugger bear and hugger bear says western education is often seen as colonizer liberal bias towards other religions and statuses. And the Western education is based on experiences in the West. And that is a perspective that is out there in the world and might feed into it. I just want to read a couple of other comments that we've had from before. A wonderful comment here from Kigali in Rwanda. Uh, This is in uh, Sanzi J, who says, I'm from, I'm very concerned about the future of African education if this situation persists. Many countries and schools around the world are turning to distance learning But I think this won't work well for most of the African countries and schools due to the previous existing inequalities and limited resources. 
Very good point made there from Afghanistan, Herat. Uh, Khalid Salar says the pandemic has had a devastating effect on the Afghan education system, which is already a low quality education system. But after the pandemic hit, the education system closed down and distance learning was non functioning Again, this idea of the disparity between uh, countries that can use technology and therefore excel and those where technology and the internet isn't as good. Finally, from Shayan Malik, um, on Twitter, Shayan says, education is a means to explore the united world rather than a polarized world in terms of religious, ethnic, uh, and status. Ugh, Shayan, I love it. Thank you so much for sending in your comments. Thank you for watching wherever you are in the world. Uh, this is Dear World Live. We have a huge uh, uh, issue that we're dealing with today, education in a polarized world. And we've been for the last sort of 30 minutes talking about polarization and how education uh, is becoming more and more difficult. But this season of Dear World Live, we're focusing on how we can overcome divisions. And today we're talking about specifically uh, overcoming divisions in classrooms and in communities and learning environments. So what is one big thing I want to ask if I can have them all up? There they are. I want to ask you guys uh, uh, a very, very important question. What is one thing, whether it's big or small, Fatima, Jayathma, Bhagarshi, that we can do, whether you're a student, whether you're a teacher, whether you're me, <laughs> any one of us, what can we do to try and build bridges and combat polarization? Fatima, you first. Well, I think we should look at not only uh, education in terms of numbers, but in terms of content. What are we teaching in schools? How we treat uh, teaching tolerance, inclusion, um, understanding of differences. I, I think when we talk about education, we just talk about uh, people being in school. But we have to talk about what does it mean to be in school? How are you taught to uh, navigate your way around difference? And I think more and more we see polarization because uh, schools are not as inclusive of differences. We have in many communities where people go to schools in their own neighborhood, where they're going to schools with people who are like them. Uh, so, uh, and we see a lot of things that are taken out of the curriculum, for example, uh, teaching uh, people about uh, people in other parts of the world. Uh, curriculums have become much uh, smaller, they've shrunk in terms of teaching of history, for example, in terms of uh, um, teaching geography, but also uh, when we talk about education, we seem to be talking about schools. Where else do we get our education? And how can we start to look at that more carefully? Young I love that. I get most it. of my education, Fatima, from TikTok. Um, <laughs> that is where go. I learn most things. That is, I'm, I'm not even joking. I can tell you thousands of facts that I've learned off TikTok. Fatima um, made really excellent points there, Jayathma. Bhagashri, I'll come to you in a moment. We're learning in way more ways than just the classroom. In fact, if I'm honest with you guys, schools and classrooms just feel sort of too rigid. Learning isn't happening there anymore. Is the education system itself what's holding us back from learning, Jayathma? And what can we do about it? What is one solution that you can offer? I think, I mean, there's two sides to it, Nilufa. I think we can, you, me, Bhagashri and Fatima can say that because we've had the privilege of being in a classroom and, you know, having access to that to textbooks and, and teachers and, and having this learning. But there are millions of young people who haven't even stepped foot in a classroom, who haven't really been able to touch a textbook, be sit in a classroom, learn from a teacher. And when you ask me what is the one thing that the world can do to fix this problem, I say investments, investments, investments in girls' education. We've had some really good progress in the past couple of decades in increasing the numbers of girls that are having access to basic education. But as Fatima said, the COVID-19 pandemic is really taking us back and taking us backwards in that progress. Um, when you educate a girl, you educate a village because uh, an educated girl is likely to have fewer and healthier children, and she's more likely to educate her children. So investment in education of a girl can actually bring so many more evident evidence than just investing in a single person's education. So um, I would say what we need to do is getting all those girls who are outside of the classrooms into the classrooms. And Fatima said, really focusing on the quality of the education then we provide to them. Thank you so much, Asma. Bhagashree, 
No, please go ahead, Fatima. Don't, don't let me interrupt you. I just wanted uh, to add on to what uh, Jessima said, uh, and you're absolutely right. We must increase the access of girls uh, in, in, in our schools and education, but there must be a note of caution. When you push so much for girls' education, the boys are left behind, which is what we now see, a whole generation of boys who are left behind. So I think, uh, yes, access to education is important, but we should be careful when we prioritize one gender over the other. But we must rebalance. This is this this goes without saying because the COVID nineteen pandemic has had un un tellable damage uh, done to, to young girls. And I'll only offer this fact that the United Nations um, uh, taught me last year: when girls get out of school, they don't often come back. It is much harder to get young women and young girls back into education after uh, a big break um, like the one that COVID-19 has done. It's time to move to buggery. You've heard so much buggery. You're a young person, you're a woman, you're a person of color, you understand what it's like to navigate this world, um, whether you're learning on TikTok like me or in a classroom, wherever it might be. Do you find that we're having the right conversation here? What, would, what do you make of the debate and the conversation we've had so far on Dear World Live? Um, the first thing that I would say is that the conversation that we had should be the one that should be conducted in all classrooms, all homes, and not just restricted to the school or to the educational system. And one thing that I would like to point out being a student is that progress can only happen when you realize that learning should be endless. You sh as a student, you should never restrict yourself to textbooks, and especially in this polarized world, you should realize what is not just happening in your surroundings, you should also realize the amount of students who are not getting access to education in the country and how different issues have been happening and how you, what you can do to help solve these issues. I will leave that there because otherwise I'm going to have to have at least four or five hours of your time. And I know it's very late in Sri Lanka and in India. Thank you so much to my wonderful guests. We have been speaking to Jarathma Wickramanayaka, Fatima Akilu, and Bhagad Shri uh, Prabhatandokar. Can you all wave goodbye? Thank you so much for your time and for your involvement. I'm so thrilled to have had you all on my show. Thank you. Now, the conversation doesn't stop there. Those of you watching online, stay where you are. There is so much more that we do at Doha Debates. If I went through all of it, I don't have time. So I'm just gonna tell you one thing that we thought we can do at Doha Debates to help combat polarization. And that was just to have better conversations, better quality conversations. And believe me, I didn't sort of agree with any of this until I did one of these classes and listened and watched the videos. My life is better for having had um, access to the deep dives and the video series and the accompanying lesson plans that give uh, students the tips and tools that they need. This is for anybody. If you're a teacher, this is such a cool resource for you. You could see exactly what I mean about lesson plans and more if you go to dohadebates.com forward slash deep dive and look for the Better Conversations Lessons Plan and other modules for teaching Doha Debates content. We've done the hard work for you. Now it's time for you to sort of be the change that you want to see in the world, if I might be able to paraphrase that. Thank you so much for watching today's episode of Dear World Live. And I wanna leave with just one more comment that I saw flashing up here from um, Ioness Demetrius. And Ioness says, I'm impressed with your ideas and dialogue about the importance of education in the contemporary and not only times. Congratulations for doing this. Thank you very much. And uh, very finally, one here from Kevin. We as adults must pick up the slack as well and mentor others when we see an opportunity to do so. At 54, I still remember important ethics taught to me at 15 years of age by my boss at my first job as a teenager. Thank you, Mr. Marty. Well, thank you, Mr. Marty, and thank you to all of you for watching. That is all the show that I have for you today. We will be back in a month with a very special episode of Dear World Live to mark World Health Day. That's all from us. Bye-bye.